set of abnormal circuits or signals that are in there you have to change. Yes. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and uh, we're going to have a, a remarkable discussion today with the uh, academic, amazing guy, Dr. Bob Thiel, who's also a nutritional expert, but he has gone and done an amazing analysis. He's done so many different books that are up on uh, his website, CogWriter, C-O-G-W-R-I-T-E-R dot com. This one we're going to talk about today is the Peace Deal of Daniel 927. Now, uh, apocalyptic writing, I just want to ex expound on this just a minute. Apocalyptic writing in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the prophecies, never sets dates, but it sets signs. And if you've got 500 signs and you're up to 497, you know that things are about to happen. What they would do in the, in the tower, it says, you know, in, in Matthew 24, it says, no man knows the day or the hour. It not only says that you will know the day or the hour, but the minute. And it did it not by setting a date or time, by setting signs, so that when you follow all the signs and you're up in the tower with the shofar and it's the last light of the day, which means the start of the new day, which of course is sundown in the Hebrew calendar, it means that the signs are there that the final peace treaty is going to happen. Now, so when people say no man knows the day or the hour, that's so that the profane, the people who don't believe God and don't follow the signs, because belief, which is a process that requires faith, and faith you receive from God, you don't have it yourself. You actually have to exchange love or trust with God, and he gives you faith. And when he gives you faith, he gives you signs so you can read the Bible and you start to see the signs laid out in front of you. When you follow those signs, the way is referred to in the first three centuries of the church, then God will reveal himself that he is prescient over everything that was created and is created and whoever will be. And to him, everything is now. There's no such thing as a past, present, or future to God. So when he's telling us in Daniel 9, 27 through the prophets, and he says in Daniel, close up and seal the words of the book till the time of the end, the unsealing is now. The unsealing means that without setting dates, if you follow these signs, you will see a very clear indication and in an extremely near future, we're going to have a peace treaty that will stabilize the Middle East, prevent world war, at least temporarily, uh, which is going to be broken in the middle of that seven year period and result in a battle called Armageddon that will result in the destruction of a lot of the planet. And a lot of people who are not believers will curse God for what's going to happen. And the believers will get their faith strengthened because they know in the midst of the fire, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were being burnt in a fire seven times hotter than needed to, bear, to coat or, or bake bricks, that they were alive with a fourth man, which is the Son of God, which means God incarnate in the flesh. So we're dealing with a situation here where, but you can't please God without faith, you can't get faith without love, and once you have faith, you receive signs, and signs to get not only tell you the day or the hour, but the minute the revelation of God's going to occur. And I think today what we want to do is go through this, and God doesn't make you brainless. In fact, he set up the Bible almost like a mathematical, multidimensional equation. And you've done an amazing job here, Dr. Bob, going through the analysis of many different books and so on to kind of put together a, a thesis. It's my contention that the signs will be so obvious that the obvious person will reject it out of the fact of its being so straightforward. Rather well, than you know, so we hidden. can just interject on that. Uh, what's interesting along that line, uh, people have rejected the book of Daniel specifically because it's accurate. Uh, I, somebody right. well, that's, was, that's uh, why I think the same thing is going to happen now. In fact, it's one of the things that I talk to rabbis about this, and Jewish rabbis hate the book of Daniel. And they hate it because it sets specific signs and dates that have happened. And as a result of it in the calendar, when, then when the signs are opened up, uh, it's going to be, you're going to see a lot of rejection, not because it doesn't look obvious or even common sense, or like filling in an equation and with the variables and coming up with a number. They're going to reject it because it's so straightforward. Well, I, I think that that's one option. As I said, I, I have a feeling it's both going to be more that it won't be straightforward enough for them, but one well, I, think it'll be, I, think it'll be straight, I, I think it'll be straightforward enough to be a great harvest of people into belief, and including people from Muslims, Sabbatean Jews, atheists, agnostics, transhumanists. I think the great harvest is already happening. We have this year four God movies, two of them right now in the theaters. Uh, you know, God's Not Dead and uh, Heaven's, uh, Heaven is Real. Uh, they're right in theaters right now. God is giving a summer basket of fruit to the population of Earth to tell them that He's there, he's on the throne, he's not nervous, and yes, Satan is going crazy because it's the end of his lease, but God's not dead, and he's going to deal with this. If you deal frankly with what's going on, like with our government, with the globalists trying to reduce the world population, with the war drums beating to start a nuclear war, 
Uh, everything about this planet, right down to healthcare, is so evil, is so malignant, it is so terminal, God has to deal with it. And uh, I don't, it's well beyond the capacity of mankind or voting for the right politician to fix what's going on. This requires supernatural intervention. And uh, God's going to do it. He's going to do it real soon, too. So let's start with the thesis. I, I'm so excited about uh, this discussion today. Let's get started with the uh, initial information. All right. The, uh, what, what happens from time to time is people, you know, they want to know what science are you looking for, you know, what's the next big thing to happen and that kind of thing. A few years ago, I think I was watching Glenn Beck, I'm not positive, but it could have been him. He was interviewing uh, uh, Dr. Tim LaHaye. Uh, for your listeners' uh, edification, if you don't know who he is, uh, he's a, a Protestant minister, and he was the theological uh, brains, if you will, behind the Left Behind series of books. Oh, yeah. Right. Those, are, those are fiction books. And uh, a guy by the name of Jerry Jenkins uh, took LaHaye's theology and tried to make it interesting to people. So they came up with this uh, series of books, and a lot of people started to look at them. And so anyway, so he was interviewed by, uh, like I say, I saw him on the news, and he was asked, what's the next sign that Christians should be looking for? What's the next end-time sign? And he says, the rapture. And... The interviewer says, well, anything else? Nope, that's it. Okay, now I watched this interview, oh, I don't know, three, four years ago. I don't remember precisely when it was. Right. And, you know, a lot of signs have happened since the, this particular interview, but apparently uh, Mr. LaHaye didn't think there was anything else that was going to happen. Right. Now, I, I have his so-called nonfiction book where he lists out uh, the end-time events. And I also have one by somebody who is... Uh, What's less sensational, I guess? A guy by the uh, name of uh, Dr. John uh, Wolverd is called the uh, Prophecy Knowledge Handbook. And Wolverd was a, a theologian at a Baptist uh, seminary out in uh, Texas. And he actually partially was involved in the translation of the New King James Version of the Bible. So he's a pretty knowledgeable guy, or considered to it. And he lists out the events people are supposed to see. And number one, he puts a pre-tribulation rapture, which I don't believe is scriptural. No. Then he talks about two or a couple other things which are scriptural. Then number four in his list, and if you've got his book, it's page 551 in his book. Uh, he says the seven-year peace treaty with Israel. And so that, what he's referring to there is Daniel 9.27. Right. Now, before I get there, uh, let me just go back a little bit. One problem I've had were people who falsely predicted the return of Jesus Christ is they come up with criteria that are not in the scriptures. Uh, for example, Harold Camping came to mind. Uh, Harold Camping, for your listeners' information, said Jesus was going to come uh, two years ago, uh, May 21st, 2012. There were posters, billboards up, people distributing all kinds of leaflets. Millions of dollars were spent to uh, discredit Christianity, if you will, because uh, their hypothesis was wrong. Jesus right. didn't come then. But the problem was it was based on mathematical calculations that had nothing to do with what the Bible says. Now, exactly. I'm not going to uh, uh, quote all the scriptures, but if your listeners decide they'd like to look at Matthew chapter 24, first few verses, basically it says, uh, they, they see these great buildings, Jesus, ah, they're, all, they're not going to stay this way, they're going to be destroyed. And the apostles are like, okay, could you tell us when this is going to be, when's the sign of your coming, when's the last days, this kind of stuff. First thing Jesus says, look, don't let anybody con you, or don't let anybody deceive you on this. So he goes through and says there's going to be a lot of stuff. Uh, right. Wars, rumors of wars. Uh, uh, earthquakes uh, in diverse places, all those Right, kind of famines, uh, false religion, false Christ, all kinds of stuff. And he says, but the end is not yet. Okay, right. so that's not it. Then he goes into other things. He talks about uh, uh, the gospel of the kingdom being preached. And as, as I can hear that background noise, I'm going to explain why. Daniel 9.27 is consistent with what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 when we come back. Exactly, and why the book is rejected by both Jews and in many ways, obliquely, by many Christians. Back in a moment. Welcome back to the Neutral Medical Report. And uh, I want you to, we're going to start posting a lot of news items over at our main news site, which is clayandiron.com. These articles are pretty important for you to consider. And the reason is, it's not just going to preserve you spiritually, it's going to preserve you physically from making stupid mistakes. Uh, like the people 
over the years and millennia that went up to the top of hills a thousand years ago and thought God was going to take them, or uh, you know, uh, you know, in other words, there's been lots of false prophets over the many centuries. The signs that are coming, there's so many false teachers like Tim LaHaye and these other characters that take things out of context or they walk around with what I call cognitive distance. They believe firmly in things that are directly in contradiction to each other. But Correct. this uh, quote, quote in Second Peter it says, and the thing is, the people that are good at biblical analysis are also very good at science and mathematics because God didn't make us brainless. He actually wanted us to use our brains to realize like a locksmith with tumbler locks. Second Peter 2.10, it says that no scriptures are private interpretation. In other words, it's like a series of equations. Uh, you're looking at the same event from multiple points of view through multiple prophets down through the ages. And if you actually look at it like that, like one great earthquake, uh, you know, and you look at specific events, what happens is they all start to, to explain each other. And the scriptures, you have to take the Bible as a whole, not just parts of it, selectively right. or take it out of context. And that's a, that's a problem that a lot of people have when they when they uh, put out these improper uh, interpretations of scripture. But as right. I was mentioning before, if if, if your listeners you know, look what Jesus said in Matthew uh, 24, in, in f- verse 15, it, there's a very interesting thing. It says, "We see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Uh, let him who uh, sees understand." Which suggests, by the way, that people will not understand who see it. Okay, right. that's one of the concerns I have. Because I think that's proof. That well, a lot of them, the ones that won't understand are going to be filled with, I call it cognitive distance. They're going to say, "Well, I have a stack of books by Tim LaHaye, and you know the 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 you know the rapture, or or you know everybody's gone, and their clothes are neatly folded, and the shoes are there, and their body's gone." There's a new movie coming out in another month or so, and it's not even said to be Christian, where people just disappear, like ninety percent of the population disappears, and it was a series on television. About two years ago, they had a similar kind of thesis. I don't think it got a second season, but it was about disappearance. Everybody was, like, disappearing. And I think this whole idea is it's, it's, an, it's a very evil joke to think that, number one, God's going to take away all the believers, and then who in an unbelieving population is going to have anybody to witness to them? I can tell you that knowing Christians, if you have a strong Christian that faces you face-to-face, like as a doctor, and talk to other doctors about the evil of abortion, there'll be a lot fewer doctors doing abortions. If you don't have a Christian witness in front of you, you're not going to get saved. You need to have a physical person who's willing to stretch out and put themselves in unease, socially and otherwise, to tell you the truth, even though it will offend you and make your skin crawl and make you feel bad about yourself. And that's the problem is the idea of the rapture, number one, it has, God has to, says the worth of the world shall continue on its forever. Well, how can it continue when there's no believers? Because the unbelievers are the goats. They're cast into the lake of fire. There's no one left if you rapture everybody and then you cast everybody who's unsaved into the lake of fire. There's not a human being left on the planet. And what are you going to do, reassign people to be reborn to come to earth? It just doesn't make sense. It's like... This is, again, another illogical contradiction that doesn't make sense. Now, I told one lady in Dallas back in 1999, I said, well, you know, I started to try to explain this rapture confusion. And I said, here's the rapture. I said, if you happen to be here in Houston at Ground Zero and a nuke hits you, and you say, hello, Jesus, that's the rapture. Uh, I said, you know, there's no such thing as a, as a, quote, rapture where all the good people are taken out and everybody evil just gets even worse. Yeah, the, the, the pre... Um I wasn't going to cover this now, but I will right now. In my yeah. hand here, I have a book I bought by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins right. called Are We Living in the End Times? Right. Now, this is supposed to be their uh, nonfiction book. Right. Okay. And basically, and I just found a page here, on, uh, in this book, they list scriptures. Uh, this is on page 99 of what they call rapture passages, which they say uh, are not to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. They have two sets of passages, rapture passages and second coming passages. Well, anyway, in my uh, my book we talked about years ago, my 2012 book, in Appendix A, I did something a little unique. All they did is list the scriptures. I'll just well, let me just read a couple. And they just say, you know, John fourteen one two three, Romans eight nineteen, right. blah blah blah. So they, they list like right. twenty one or so scriptures. So people look at this. Say, oh, there must be all this proof because look at they list all the scriptures. Well, guess what? Right. If they would have cited the scriptures and quoted them, people would say, wait a second, this isn't saying that at all. And so right. I explained that away uh, uh, years ago. Yeah. Look, I think it. You know, carnally speaking. 
if, if God's plan was that, you know, before the Great Tribulation, uh, Christians get raptured away and we don't have to deal with any of this, hey, you know, that sounds really cool to me. It's not the plan, but it sounds really cool. Okay? Problem is, because people are going to believe things such as uh, a non existent pre tribulation rapture, when it doesn't happen, they're going to discount uh, the deal of Daniel uh, 927. I, I agree. I think that's the main breaker, deal breaker. Even if it's logical, it's right in their face like a baseball bat hitting the side of their head. They're just not going to get it. Even if it's so obvious that a child with, like my daughter with Down syndrome, 21, will understand it very plainly and simply because she's simple. She's a child. And someone who doesn't have cognitive dissonance. There's one thing about children with Down syndrome. They may be slow. Their brains are not capable because they're gestaltic of having any cognitive dissonance. If they love you, it's in genuine 100%. If you tell them something that contradicts something else, they'll tell you instantly, which is in some ways, they share a characteristic that's similar to people that have what we call genius level intelligence. There's a qualitative difference that, believe it or not, is in the same in children that are mentally slow and people that are genius. And the average person can walk around with so many conflicting ideas that completely contradict each other, and yet they think it's fine. They'll defend it to their death, even if it's something that contradicts everything else they believe. It's amazing. Yes, I know that. And so anyway, getting it's back to uh, getting back to what Jesus was saying. All right, so you, you, you read what Jesus says. He talks about the abomination and desolation being set up. Well, if you go to Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, you can see that. All right, so what's this got to do with Daniel 9.27? Now, this time... Uh, I'm going to go to the. Uh, I'm going to actually go to to that scripture, and we're going to read something in Daniel 9:27. Uh, so I get my Bible over the right page here. Right. And uh, yeah, the, the analysis that you're talking about that I did, yeah, that's an article that's at the cogwriter.com website. It's got the scriptures and it's got other citations we're going to talk about today. Anyway, right. and by the way, for your listeners, we don't we're not selling anything. We're not no, trying to charge your money or anything. Like, no, we're, we're right. trying to. I mean, we want people to ask better questions and start thinking about yeah. these things. So don't put their spiritual future or their physical future in jeopardy from stupid decisions based on false prophets and liars. Well, anyway, getting into Daniel 9.27, um, I'm going to read the whole verse. It says, Then he shall confirm a covenant, uh, which is, uh, some people say it's a treaty, peace treaty, it could be all, it's some kind of an agreement, <clears throat> uh, with many for a week, but in the middle of the week, and now let's talk about this week first. Uh, prof- this is understood to be a prophetic week of seven years. Right. Now, you say, who understands this? Even the Catholic bishop and theologian uh, Hippolytus uh, in the third century, so around 210 AD, recognized that that's what this was talking about. Yeah, it's a Hebrew week, which means it has to be 360 day years, and it has to start by rabbinic law on Sakat, right after a Shemitah year. And that's by rabbinic law. Welcome back. Uh, I want to pull up whatever more scripture you have in your article that's really uh, interesting. It says, Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and or for shall, shall have nothing? And the people of the prince that shall uh, come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary were the Romans. That is so in correct. Other words, in other words, it's got to be some form of like NATO or European, European uh, armed forces. And then America is, in a sense, the enforcer of it, because we're part of the Anglo-American extension of NATO. Uh, so it has to be a NATO force that actually is involved directly in this conflict. And since the King of the North is a, a reunified uh, superpower, a NATO-American alliance that starts this whole process off. And, yeah, the, uh, right. The, 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 the person there, uh, just for your listeners to step back on um, one thing, because sometimes you and I make assumptions people will know about things, and, and that is, we talk, this guy is called a prince in uh, Daniel 9.26. And princes are the people who become kings, by the way. Right. So the guy's not the top dog, and most likely he'll have some involvement with NATO. And I'll skip over some of what you said, but just briefly say something I mentioned to you over the, uh, uh, during the break. That is, I do believe that the Great Tribulation, the high probability is going to start under the guise of a so-called NATO exercise, but that's an old, another matter. Yeah, I, today, agree. I agree. In fact, yeah. it's supposed to, the NATO exercise is next month in western Ukraine. Well, right now I'd like to go back to the, the, the passage that if, uh, we were talking about, and that's this one in Daniel 9.27. So just before the break, I, I started to read that it talked about a deal that's made for a week. 
that's confirmed. It's confirmed for a week. And then, as I said, uh, going back at least as far as the Catholic theologian uh, and saint uh, Bishop uh, Hippolytus, and he wrote around 210, 220 A.D. or so, he said this is a seven-year deal. So this was not a brand new concept. So, um, and any Catholic listeners out there just want them to know this is not a new concept. This is not uh, uh, and a Protestant. A lot of a lot of Protestants believe it as well, and a lot of and uh, people in Church of God believe it. So, so there's a there's a, but not everybody does, and that's one of the reasons why I don't think people are going to believe it. But we'll go further here. So anyway, so. Getting into this, it says in the middle of the week, he's going to bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. You say, okay, he's talking about abomination and desolation. When does that happen? Well, if you go to Daniel 11.31, this guy is now a king, by the way, uh, and he's called the king of the north several, several portions of this particular uh, chapter of Daniel 11. So the prince is now a king. And in verse 31, we find out that forces are going to be mustered by him. He's going to defile the sanctuary fortress, and then they're going to take away the daily sacrifices put there, the abomination of desolation. And the reason this is important, when people are trying to understand you know, what's the significant thing to look for in prophecy, well, Jesus said, when you see this abomination set up that Daniel warned about, okay, it's time to flee. The Great Tribulation starts a couple of verses later in Matthew. And so this is a big deal. So the question is, what precedes verse 31? And what precedes verse 31 is going to be this deal of Daniel 9.27. Yeah, what's in the deal, though? The, 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 the one thing I'd like to clarify to people is the abomination that desolates. And most people don't see this. Because the blood of Jesus completely paid the price for all sin on earth forever, the abomination is the blood sacrifice on the Temple Mount that can only occur first day on Sukkot. And the desolation means that as part of the deal, they have to desolate or remove Jews from part of the land and partition the land, which is proscribed in Genesis 12.3. So we're seeing basically a start of blood sacrifice by people who reject Messiah, who accept the partitioning of the land as a means to bring peace and the setting up of a Palestinian state. That's the two key elements you have to have in order for this to be an abomination that desolates. Well, historically, and that's where some people get a little bit confused about this, and, and one thing about the book of Daniel, uh, I saw some negative things written about me today on the Internet because I quoted the book of Daniel yesterday in an article I wrote, basically making fun of me for actually believing that the Bible is true and picking on me saying that uh, the book of Daniel wasn't written until the time of the Maccabees, and that's the reason that it's so accurate because all these things already happened and therefore, uh, if God didn't inspire it, it's all just a big con. Well, they, these are academic midgets that like ad hominem attacks rather than use of logic, so they need to be dismissed. Yes. Right, so, they, so they, they, they dismissed my quoting the book of Daniel and my reliance on the book of Daniel, and I'm hoping your listeners well, well, uh, will not have that know that. They, that's why they specifically have rabbinical writings against Daniel, because they proscribe against talking about Daniel or even about the wise men, because it throws everything into gear that shows that the exact time of Messiah's first arrival, Yeshua. And uh, it also shows the time of the resolution of the two houses of Israel, uh, the house of Joseph or Ephraim and the house of Judah, at the time of the end by this covenant, which God brings closure. And it, it, the thing that I find most amazing is God is so straightforward that if you're honest with God, he'll tell you straight up. If you're dishonest with God, he'll confuse you on purpose. He'll allow you to deceive yourself. Right. and. Um, getting back to, I'm trying to figure out which group to talk about. I think right now, let's, I'd like to stick with the Catholic side for a moment. Okay. I mentioned Hippolytus. Well, the uh, Catholic saint and doctor of the church, Jerome, he wrote that correctly, he says Hippolytus has his final week at the end of the world, divides it in the period for Elijah in the period of the Antichrist. And so he says that the sacrifice uh, and offering are going to cease, and Christ is going to come and slay the wicked one and all that kind of stuff. So Jerome understood that this was an end-time prophecy. And there was another Catholic uh, a bishop by the name of Apollinaris who basically said the same thing. He said, this is the time uh, uh, we're, going to see, uh, we're going to see the Antichrist power, the beast power rise up, and that's what this has to do with. But some other Catholic writers didn't share that view. And so when I was reading Jerome... He's like, well, some say this and some say that. Well, now we've got the situation where some of the Catholics have adopted a position which is consistent with some of the Protestants, which is that um, we'll ignore people like Tim LaHaye, uh, Jerry Jenkins, and uh, J. 
John Wolver to at least believe that this has an end-time application. A lot of people believe it was already fulfilled. And I'm going to read from... Pre- a preterism, book. right? It's called preterism. Yes, preterism. <clears throat> and so I'm going to read from... A, uh, this guy's a Jesuit priest. His name is William Kurse. Uh, it's, the book has an imprimatur on it from a Catholic bishop. It's called What's the Bible Say About End Times? And he says, Daniel 27 seems to apply directly to circumstances related to Emperor Antiochus and the Maccabees. Okay, now I want to comment on that for a second. So what he did there was uh, not only did he stop the Jewish sacrifice, he put his pagan god into the, uh, into the region. So that's something we may see happening uh, uh, after three and a half years after the, the deal is broken. And so it says uh, halfway through the period, the emperor put, a, put an end to the temple sacrifices. He profaned the temple with the abomination that is desolate, which was basically something to do with, like, the pagan god Zeus. However, after three and a half years after he profaned the temple, he died. And then, so they basically discount that this has future application. But then this priest writes, Mark 13, 14 makes a mysterious reference to a future abomination that will be similar to the abomination of Daniel. It's like, huh? Yeah, well, that's how the that's, Bible that's works. That's the it same often thing Jesus a... is talking about in Matthew 24 that he's referring right. to there. Right. So he says, so basically what this priest is writing is that this has been fulfilled, but, you know, there's some scriptures that suggest it's future, but, you know, we're not going to go there, basically. We don't want to yeah, know. Yeah. Right. And so because of that, because of that, I think we're going to have a lot of people who accept this. And again, it's not just a, uh, the so-called intellectual Catholics who've dis miss this, but uh, uh, pseudo-academic Protestants and some others have all said, okay, this has all been fulfilled, and it's not going to be fulfilled. And then the other argument, by the way, that I should address here is that some say, okay, it's there. It wasn't completely fulfilled by uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, but actually it's all fulfilled by Jesus Christ coming, because when Jesus Christ came, uh, he caused uh, the need for the sacrifices to cease, and therefore uh, it's all fulfilled in Christ, and therefore it has no end time application, and therefore we can ignore this, etc. I mean, that, that's that's another view that's out there, and that's a fairly common common view. Right. E- even even some uh, Church of God Christians believe that, which is a, a, a sad that they do, but a lot of people believe that. Well, yeah, exactly. A lot of faith will be destroyed when things don't happen, and it starts to get nuts. I guess the next uh, issue is, you know, the main tagline for the show is to ask better questions, whether it's uh, your health, uh, your spirituality, your finances, your prepping, uh, every uh, part of your life to understand. And, and again, God says, you know, that he wants people to to uh, study to be approved. In other words, you have to apply yourself and you have to apply to honesty. All the great scientists, all the great authors, all the great theologians, the truly understood things got rid of their cognitive dissonance and their ability to lie to themselves and deceive themselves or accept deceptions from others. And well, uh, give, give an example of someone uh, is expecting and has got a, a library of books by Tim LaHaye and other s- similar authors, and now their husband has died, they've been chipped, uh, there's starvation, there's been mass devastation, there's foreign troops on American soil. Uh, what kind of faith are they going to have? Are they going to think, well, I'm one of the lost now, I've not been raptured, and now I'm chipped? People need to start kind of getting real that, uh, as I say, there's two companies, the company of uh, Joseph or Ephraim and the company of Judah, and God said, I will bring the truth through my two witnesses. It's not necessarily individuals, it's two peoples that are speaking. And, for example, right now we have these uh, these Messianic believer uh, former rabbis in Israel, and we talked about this with Carl Gallup's, that are speaking truths to people that are sabotaging Satanistic Jews who believe in the Talmud of Babylon and Zohar, but yet they're accepting Messiah now and they're rejecting that. We're getting witnesses like yourself, uh, Dr. Bob, that are actually witnessing out of the company of the house of Ephraim, they're telling people the truth before the time of the end, because when the end comes, a lot of people are going to have pretty fragile faith. It's going to be broken pretty easily because they don't have the truth deep in their bones and it says in the tribulation, he says, because they love not the truth, and you have to love it, I shall send them a strong delusion so that even those who are the elect would be deceived. And you're not going to be deceived if you listen to this program, if you go to Cogwriter and read all these articles. 
You're going to start getting away from deception because deception will destroy you physically, spiritually, financially, and you won't be prepped and ready for what's coming. You won't have your Shabbat clothes not only physically but spiritually ready for what's going to happen because it'll shock you into a state where you feel paralyzed. And you need to get beyond that. Long before the time of trouble comes, you need to have it straight in your mind of what of who God is and how he's going to rescue us. And then we have to put all our faith in God. He'll tell us where the places of refuge are. He'll tell us what we have to do next. And don't second-guess God thinking that you've got this great author and he's going to tell you you're going to get raptured, so don't worry about how bad it's going to get for the poor people left on earth. God, let's put it this way. God sent me back from the dead at eight and a half so that I could witness to a company of people so that they would not share eternal hellfire and destruction. And he's doing that for all you Christians out there, that no matter how what torture, blindness, amputations, rape, murder, horrible things be done to you, just so one individual could be saved. In fact, that's what Jesus has said in a sense, that even if he came back to save one person from eternal destruction and separation from the Creator, he would have died for us. And when you grasp that, that love, you have to understand that's why we suffer. Because our blood is joined to Jesus' blood when we hear and do his will. And it's a very important thing you have to understand that because if we don't get it clear in our mind that we have to love the truth, we're going to suffer and we're going to not be the witnesses we need to be to save those from not only physical destruction, but spiritual death, the death of the soul. That's how important yeah, the, it is. Yeah, what, what a lot of people uh, seem to miss construe is that they seem to think as long as they're okay themselves this is this is fine but if you read the scriptures jesus says to pray that you'll be counted worthy to escape these things and stand before the son of man and you've got the situation where uh, god expects people to support the work of getting the truth out there and a lot of people don't realize that and actually and uh, i'll just step back for a second i we talked about matthew 24 15 it says when you see the abomination desolation spoken by daniel the prophet and again that ends up tying with daniel 9 27 so for your listeners just want to know okay what's the next thing to be looking for that's one of them but interestingly the other thing jesus says the gospel kingdom is going to be preached to all the world's a witness and the end is going to come and people who aren't involved in uh, fulfilling matthew 20 14 uh, I, I believe will not be kind of worthy to escape all things. If you read in the book of Revelation, and I've seen rapturous quote uh, a passage in uh, uh, Revelation 3.10, the Church of Philadelphia, because you've kept my uh, uh, patience and my word to endure, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to try the world. And they say, see, see, this means Christians are going to be raptured. No. And it doesn't mean that at all. It means that some Christians, because you read Revelation 2 and 3, there are Ephesus-type Christians, Sardis-type Christians, Pergamus Christians, Thyatirans, uh, Sardisians, uh, 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 Laodiceans, Philadelphians. And if you go to uh, Revelation 12, verses 14 through 17, it talks about two groups. The woman, the more faithful, flees to a place in the wilderness for a time, time, and half a time. But in verse 17, and then it says, the dragon, or Satan, was enraged with the woman, and went to make war with her, with her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, oddly, Protestants, I've seen them say, oh, this is talking about converted Jews. No, it's talking about real Christians. Right. They, they call it converted Jews because it says, look, they keep the get the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. When they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, everybody knows, okay, they've got to be Christians. So a lot of Protestants are like, oh, these must be Jews because Protestant yeah, theologians, yeah. many of them do not believe they need to keep commandments, even though the average Protestant, I think, thinks they're, they're, in, they're in effect. <laughs> I've read the stuff yeah. that Protestant theologians like, oh, no, those are all nailed to the cross. And it's like, oh, yeah? Well, the early church all believed them. But right. because people are being deceived by a lot of misinterpretations of prophecy, because a lot of people are not going to know what's happened, and when the deal does happen, now um, I suspect it won't be as clear. Now it is possible, as you indicated before, it might be so clear and nobody will pay attention yeah, to it. I, I, I think what will happen is it'll be so clear that these dis, these dissuasive, anti-Christian, lying voices out there. But it says he's going to. Basically, God said that I will seal up the sky so there shall be no rain during the time of the two witnesses. And what he's really saying is, there's going to be two groups of people that are going to speak truth to the Jews and to real Christians during the time of the end. And these false prophets, he's going to silence them. So anybody who checks their spirit, because you can always check your spirit in prayer, 
or are going to know the ring of truth from the from what's coming, and uh, the population is not prepared to suffer. The population is not prepared for war. The population is not prepared for devaluation of the dollar or forced vaccines or airborne plagues. They're prepared for nothing. The church is distracted. The church is is out of touch with reality. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what church it was, but I recently heard a quote that says the pastor said, we're the welcoming party. We don't understand prophecy and we're not going to get, go there. That's the typical response now to much of the Christian church, the big mega churches. They are an abomination. They're not part of the collective of what I call believers. You are not a Christian. It is not a noun. It's a verb. If oh. you're a Christian, you're a witness, which means you're going to witness with your blood, your life, your treasure, your time, everything for God. And not just some. God doesn't want ten, a tithe of you. He wants 100%. Well, between one-fifth and one-third of the Bible is prophecy. And right. if you read uh, Mark uh, 13, which is also, by the way, it says, look for this abomination, desolation, that's the big sign. At the end of the passage of that chapter, Jesus says, I'm telling you, you've got to watch. And if prophecy was not important, he wouldn't say that. And he, he says watch multiple times in there. Right. People, are, people will not... Will, will not pay attention. When it happens, they'll discount it. One thing we talked about in the break, and I'll be very brief about this, um, Catholic prophecy from a, a saint by the name of Malachi said there were supposed to be 112 popes from 1149 or 329, excuse me, uh, to present. And we've had uh, the current pope, by the way, is number 112. There's absolutely right. no doubt that on the There's list... No the way, his, uh, behavior, his behavior proves that he's the last pope. This well, he, is, he, meets the, he meets the criteria, but do you, you don't see even, even Catholics who supposedly would believe something written by one of their saints. They are like, they don't. They're just they're discounting it, and that one is is pretty obvious. Now I'm not. Uh, when I talk, when I talk to Christians, I don't rely on Catholic prophecy, but when, but when I talk is, to it's, it's obvious, and people still ignore it. Well, when I talk to Christian uh, Catholics that listen to this program, I have not encountered one who disagrees with the fact of Malachi's prophecy, and they understand that our pope, the pope, their pope, is not a Christian. Well, the, yeah, the final that. pontiff is going to be an anti-pope, and this guy, is, as I wrote in my book, The Last Pope, I said, is a pope Catholic. The last pope would not be, and this guy has done things that flat out go against canon law and Catholic tradition. Even basics, like, you know, the catechism. <laughs> yeah. It's it's so obvious that even if you're a grade two student in Catholic private school, you'd understand this pope ain't a pope. I'll tell you, as I say, the peace deal of Daniel 9.27, we need to have a part two, part three, etc. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, Dr. Bob Thiel. On that, but you're, you're an amazing guy. Let's just go to cogwriter.com, there's an article on it. Exactly, many articles there. Uh, the important thing is you have to study to be approved. God wants you to use your intellect. And if you love the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you don't love the truth, you'll be enslaved by lies, cognitive dissonance, and the dark powers of evil. And you won't be prepared. Back in hour two, don't miss it. Ryan and I will be talking about nutraceuticals and Tim Alexander, Chris Harris, third hour. 